call the select board meeting to order. It's um, Thursday, February 3rd, and, um, and we're online. So um, first item is to set adjust agenda. I know that we have a couple things. One is on the agenda, there's an executive session that I believe we need to drop, correct? Yes. And um, there was something else about the uh, yellow barn. Item eight. Eight. That needed to change to something else? Uh, just, we're gonna table that for now. Oh, okay, you sure? Um, we don't have that. We can't continue for go forward with the applications without the state permit. Oh, and that's not for the state permit. That's that's for oh. the, that's for the local permit. Oh, okay, okay. So you're good. Yeah. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna um, delete the executive session, and we are we deleting item eight? I thought there was a note about changing it to something else. Hang on. Um, um, where is that? Uh, so, um, there was a note. I don't know if this is from Casey to change item eight from the yellow barn water sewer application to an update on existing economic development loan for business being sold. Yeah, that would be Connie's kitchen. Yeah, okay. So yeah. we'll do, okay, so those two changes, anything else? Could we have a motion to adjust the agenda for those two changes? So move. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Good. All right. That's everyone. Motion carries. Um, all right. Next item is, is what? Um, communication from the audience. Is anybody on who wants to address the select board about something that's not on the agenda? Now would be the time. All right. Hearing none. We're going to move on to um, approving minutes from, we've got two meetings from the last regular meeting, which was January 20th, and the special meeting, which was January 24th. I thought the minutes looked good. Could we have a motion to approve, Ezra? So moved. Second. Great. And that's for both, both sets of minutes. Yes. yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? Thank you to the minute takers. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. And Kaylee, that was an aye. Yeah, I don't know if I can abstain from just the meeting minutes of the 20th, but. Just vote aye. That's good. Aye. They look all great. Right. <laughs> um, all right. Great. So motion carries. Next is um, town manager's report given by David Upson, who is live in the Memorial Building. Yep. Um, so uh, Kaylee knows about this. Um, I think a handful of others do too, but uh, Norwich EV uh, received the state, state grant to own and operate EV chargers in a handful of Vermont towns. Uh, Norwich EV reached out to me requesting assistance with locating a host site. Um, either town owned or privately owned property. Uh, I met with Chris Duff, who is the project manager for the Buffalo Mountain Co-op Move. Um, I will be participating with them in conversations with Norwich EV and Hardwick Electric to get this project off the ground. They're, um, they're wanting to be a host site for the EV chargers. And there's three of them. There's two, uh, two smaller ones and a level two, a high speed. Uh, for two cars, so they would need four parking places. Um, we looked at the diner parking lot, which we would have to bring service over to there. Um, there's no electrical service nearby, um, so it would have to be a substantial, um, you know, infrastructure build right on the in the middle of town. And then um, the parking lot across from the co-op 
there was the concrete wall. They can't hang them on the concrete wall. So they need some space. Um, and there just wasn't enough space there. So uh, that left us with the Daniels block uh, area that were kind of uh, in limbo with the proposed park. So um, that left us with the co-op. So I think I think it's a good thing. Um, they they're excited about it, and uh, they have the space for it. So we'll see how it goes. Did you also consider the old flood zone lot? I I didn't consider the old flood zone lot, um, but we would have to the requirements um, for where they put it. We would have to upgrade that area um, pretty substantially and make it a parking lot. Right, but anywhere like if those if this is the same grant that we discussed quite a long time ago yeah um the spots will have to be reserved for ev charging right yeah so, I mean, you wouldn't be able to park in them I, I i mean if there were no parking places in the parking lot and you park there i mean i i suppose that somebody from the co-op would have to come out and say you can't park here but i don't yeah. yeah, but typically, yeah, the, they're, they're spots dedicated for EV chargers or users of them. Right. So rather than have us tie up parking spaces in town lots, this is something that they're comfortable with doing. Um, you know, they're, they're talking with Norwich EV, and if it works for them, I think they, they'll move forward. Cool. And David, these would be available to non-customers as well, if need be. Yeah, it's not um, specific to Buffalo Mountain Co-op customers. Um, the part of the agreement would be it would be open to whoever needs to use them um, for charging. Welcome, Sherry. Made it. Um, any other questions? Carry on. Um, so Spring Festival 2022 is in its planning stages. Um, groups and organizations within the Hardwick community are working together to try to make this a fun and welcoming event for all of Hardwick and the Hardwick area. Uh, there's quite a group of people that have come forward that are really excited about trying to make um, spring, bring Spring Festival back and make it, um, make it a lot of fun and for the community. Um, funding is always a challenge. Um, so in the future, um, I feel that it's important to that we put a line item in the budget for spring, fe spring festival activities and planning. Um, there's been some requests for funds, and I'm going to try and honor some of those requests if we can. Um, I'm gonna, next week, I'm going to go to the recreation meeting and see if they have any available funds for uh, this endeavor. And... Um, you know, I'm just putting it out there to you guys as well that uh, this is um, something that there's a fair amount of people want to get involved in to include Kiwanis, um, Hart, um, the neighbor to neighbor group a little bit and um, recreation committee, um, hopefully, and uh, Modern Times Theater. Um, just to, name, just to name a few. Well, since it's a big part of activity in downtown, I think downtown commission wants to try to help out as far as uh, trying to, at least I had a conversation today talking about how, you know, some of the fundraising possibilities like the Price Chopper Goal of Foundation is somebody to ask for some, um, some funding and uh, there's other options and yeah. Yep. And, and, I, and I, I know, and I didn't want to really bring this up, but I feel like I should. I know that the fireworks are, um, have been an item of contention and a lot of people are mixed on the field, you know, on fireworks, but I would want to maybe open that up to discussion and you know, the fact that we spend $4,000 in 20 minutes for, um, for what we get out of it. I mean, I have mixed feelings about fireworks, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, so I don't know if, if we can come up with 
four thousand dollars for fireworks maybe we should try to figure out a way to fund some part of the spring festival at least match what others are bringing to the table or maybe we can reallocate some of the fireworks money in the past with there have been fireworks donations from area businesses for folks who really care about fireworks yeah we could continue to facilitate that yeah. right and be the lead agent but if maybe if others want to contribute then the town budget could go towards supporting spring fest generally okay um i'm gonna move on so um capital so i'm starting to look at some of the projects we have moving forward and um capital improvement planning is becoming something that's on my list of priorities uh, we have some aging infrastructure in town. Uh, the pedestrian bridge is a prime example of an asset that we have that we didn't plan for the failure or inability to function as it was built to do. Um, with the select board's blessing, I would like to allocate some of the budget for capital improvement planning and additional asset management for the future. Um, I will, it will continue to be a challenge to write grants and ask for money to fix things that are broken if we don't have plans to maintain them and plan for their repair or replacement. Um, I don't want to be in crisis mode like the pedestrian bridge when something fails moving forward. Um, a lot of our, so I talked to Casey today and uh, within Nemric, there's a asset management module and we have a ton of assets that are fully depreciated. So that means we, they're in, they're in salvage. Um, so they're, they're when, a, you know, I'm, I'm learning about this, but like the sidewalks, um, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff in town that we, we should be focusing on, um, in terms of building like better. And, and I think we should s seriously start thinking about, um, some of these projects and I'd like to get them to a point where they're, you know, planned and we have public opinion and we've gone through that process where we have like a set of plans for a project and then we can, you know, go out there and look for funds and have more matching funds and um, people will take us a little bit more seriously. The, the, uh, the town garage is another example of something, right, right that yep. is on the edge of failure, right. depending on your definition of failure. And, um, and we really, we really, really need a plan. Yeah. So yeah. we need to... You know, I think we've talked about this in the past, but sprinkling, you know, five, ten thousand dollars in each building and each, you know, our major assets is is not going to get us where we want to be. It's just going to continue and things are going to continue to deteriorate. So um, one of the things that my first um, proposal is that um, Cornell um, University, they have a graduate planning internship program and um, I think Sherry passed this on to me and I got it in an email as well um, but it would be uh, we'd have to match a, a grant of uh, $1,875 to have a uh, graduate student um, work with us for 10 weeks and I think that having a, a graduate student who's you know fresh out of the planning world in education, I think that would be a huge benefit for us. And um, I think that if we wanted to, to take some money out of the community development coordinator salary that we have that Jeff doesn't use, um, we, could, we could be able to match this and have some uh, expertise, some outside expertise um, along with working with you know, town folks uh, this summer. And I think that we would, we might be able to get a little further ahead on some of our project planning. I think that's a great opportunity, Opie. Okay. Um, having tried to get interns from the University of Vermont to come, you know, to work with the Historical Society and various things, I know that one of the big problems is going to be housing. You know, where's this person going to live for 10 weeks? If you don't get somebody who lives within, you know, 45 minutes, who feels like they can commute, that could be a problem. Um, I'm just throwing that out there. Yep. We can, uh, 
we we've got some pretty nice tents these days, you know. <laughs> that, that is an agricultural school, so hopefully they're into. <laughs> can I ask? This is an awesome. I think you know, we talked about um, we talked about this in one of our budget meetings about you know knowing where the money that we're saving is going and how much those products are going to cost, combined with all the different grants that we're writing and how the funding pieces are getting puzzled together. Um, and rather doing that kind of like in a reactionary style, doing that in a proactive way. So that way we can take more advantage of the money that's out there. It totally makes sense. Um, we could absolutely, I mean, I'm all for an intern. I also, at our last meeting, and correct me if I'm wrong, we've, we haven't spent nearly as much in that um, coordinator budget as we planned. I think we could also, if the intern didn't work out, we could potentially hire a consultant to help us put something like this together. Um, I think it really needs to be done because um, especially since a lot of our budget is going to be towards putting more money towards our capital improvements. I think we wanna show that we're, we have a plan for spending that. Mm -hmm. So if we do, if there's a shortfall in that budget in that line, um, maybe we can talk about both either, either having a graduate student or putting out an RFP for somebody to help us develop that plan um, combined with not just the plan for the improvements and when they're going to be made and how they're going to be made, but also what money is available, what money we already have. Right. Um, I think it'd be super helpful and would um, certainly help your office, I would imagine. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, I had a, a long conversation with Doug Morton from NBDA uh, this week and you know, hiring consultants is great um, with specific stuff, um, but like we know the planning commission, the select board, members of the community know what we need in town. And it's just like getting out there and reaching out to them. And like that, that I don't, I, I think that we should, we should certainly try with the, with the, with an intern, you know, 1800 bucks is the a, a good investment for you know for that as far as like paying someone 30 to fifty thousand dollars to do all to collect all the information that we have i think we can i'm going to try to rally the troops and put our heads together and try to get some of this information um on paper and some of it already is i mean the the planning commission's aarp uh, audit for sidewalks i mean they did a lot of work on that and that that's complete so we just have to plug that in to uh, a little bit more of like some community focus, um, you know, community input and, and then put a budget to it, um, which I have that information. Um, I've gotten some stuff from VTrans they, that they've, um, they put dollar amounts per foot of sidewalk. So I think that we can, I think that we can get the, a lot of this information without hiring spending $50,000 or $40,000 on the consultant. So just hold off on the consultant thing. It's a good idea, but I just, I don't want to totally, I, I don't want to end up with, with something from a consultant that is going to be outdated in five years. Sure. My point was, I yeah. think however we can fund it, we will, we'll be actually saving money over time. So yeah. whether that's hiring somebody, getting an intern, okay. whatever the person is, I think that that level of that report in my mind is what we're looking for for all of our projects, which right. is a lot of work. Like it's not, it's not insignificant. So, right. um, and just, you know, however, if I think starting with this graduate student totally makes sense, but my point was just, however, we can support that. I think we will, like, we'll be, it'll be important for the future. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then last but not least, I know that people are wondering about Vorac. Um, the decisions are still being decided. They're, they're, they're still being decided on where, the, where they're gonna, uh, what grants are gonna approve. Um, we should hear something by the middle of February. It was just a lot of really good projects and it's just taken a little bit of time. Yeah, they're a little swamped because they've got Vorac and Ursa the RTP grants are uh, behind because of that. So um, that's all for me. Great, Let's thank you. Questions. Do you want um, do, do you want anything from the select board about um, specific about the idea of an intern or generally 
putting more effort and energy and money into um, planning for our capital improvements. I mean, it sounds, I believe people are in agreement, but do we want to hear that? I sure. think. Did you, uh, were you able to take a look at what the application is for the intern? Like, what do we have to do? They're, they're asking for, um, if, if we can do the match, um, and then basically just, uh, um, they're looking just for information right yeah. now and whether, yeah. whether our community will, would fit their purpose. Right, and hopefully they're taking in whatever that information is and figuring out whether they have a candidate that would have that those skills. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm gonna. Um, we have until March 30th to get the application in, um, but I'm gonna get right on it. So and maybe get somebody on the phone, so we're not just an application. And as far as housing goes, I mean, I think there are people around that have Airbnbs that we maybe would be able to figure something out amongst, in the community anyway. They might not be in the same place for the whole 10 weeks, but yeah. maybe we can figure something out. Like, because, yep. you know, yeah. there's a lot of Airbnbs, so. I don't have a guest room yet. <laughs> I only have a pet room. All right. Well, thank you, Opie. Yep. Sounds good. So moving along, next up is a road foreman report, which uh, the agenda says given by Tom Fadden, but I imagine Tom Fadden's in a truck. I, so. can, I, can, I can give that um, again this week. I talked to Tom at uh, three o'clock, I think it was. Um, they're plowing, salting, and sanding. And they, um, Tom lost four wheel drive in the, in the ton truck and his truck. Uh, he's been able to plow with, um, with it in two wheel drive, but I think they got fixed just recently. Um, they had another um, breakdown, but that's been fixed as well. So minimal breakdowns, everything's been repaired and they are um, operational. Good. Yep. Excellent. Um, all right. Next uh, police department report. We have Mike Henry on right, on online. Hello. Yeah. Hi there. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I don't want to sound all doom and gloom here, but I, I think everybody knows that we have a long road ahead of us. Um, but uh, uh, some of the you know some of the positive things that are going on. I just want to uh, talk about uh, Scott Gagnon. Um, you know he's just going above and beyond for the department and uh, uh, just can't say enough good about him with everything that he's got going on right now, uh, taking shifts and then just uh, staying beyond and just, like I say, going above and beyond. Um, <clears throat> we did have, uh, we were selected for an audit uh, through the Vermont uh, State Auditor's Office. Uh, we were fortunate enough, it was just random that uh, hard we got picked for that. So we're working on that. It's an audit through the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council of all the records uh, for two years. So that's 2019, uh, 2020, working on that. I don't think we're gonna have any issues with that. Um, I've got Amanda helping me also with some of the records that I've got there. Um, as far as personnel, you know, that's gonna be our biggest uh, hurdle that we're working on. We did, uh, um, we've been interviewing people we uh, actually had a level three person that was uh, interested in the job. We interviewed them, uh, offered the, the position, and then they, they turned it down. Um, so not 100% sure on their reasoning on that, but uh, um, I think it's, you know, uh, it, just, it just wasn't enough when they were looking at the, uh, the dollars and cents trying to drive a little bit further to Hardwick is what it came down to. Um, <clears throat> We have, uh, you know, Joe Rossi is another great officer that we've got there, but uh, unfortunately his, uh, his days might be numbered due to health issues. So I'm not sure how much longer he's, he's just one of those guys. He's, he's a former Marine. So he's, he's hanging in there. I think his wife is uh, probably telling him that, you know, it's time um, with the health issues that uh, to go, but right now he's, he's there. Um, 
Katie Simino was uh, one of our, our hopefuls to send to the academy. And Katie, uh, uh, unbeknownst to, to a lot of us, had already made the decision a year ago. She was deployed. Uh, she had applied for a position um, out of state. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, she once she got back from her deployment, she found out that uh, they still held that position for her. So she's going to take that position. She'll be moving to uh, Tennessee. So uh, we'll be losing her in two weeks. Um, but she just got back from her deployment two weeks ago. So uh, it's too bad because uh, I saw a lot of potential with her. We were scheduled, scheduling her for the academy. And uh, I think it's, you know, as she said, it was bittersweet as, you know, she's seeing changes in Hardwick. She's really happy being here, but uh, um, an opportunity came up that, uh, you know, she just couldn't turn down at this point in time. Um, <clears throat> we interviewed a candidate uh, yesterday. Uh, we're gonna start the process with that candidate uh, and uh, see if we can uh, meet the deadline. There is a full-time academy that starts in March. Paperwork's, uh, we've got to get through the, the process in less than two weeks and get everything submitted before uh, we can get that person in. We also have another interview, uh, another person interviewing. Uh, that will be tomorrow. Um, we'll see where that stands. Um, it's an out-of-state person. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not big on out-of-state people. You know, they have to show me a reason why they're going to be sticking around. Um, and, and it's mainly because of my experience with the, the state police. Usually out-of-state people uh, don't stick around very long. Um, they're here for a while and then they're, they're gone. So um, it's going to have to convince me that he's willing to stay. Um, so that'll be happening tomorrow. We're... Um, as far as my big concern was with the uh, SIU cases and also, you know, a lot of the drug cases because we don't have anyone that uh, can really dedicate the time with that. So what we've done is we've uh, uh, kind of entered into an agreement uh, type contract with the Lamont County Sheriff's Department to take on those cases. They're, they're very in depth. Um, and that's just going to uh, help us out. We've been fortunate right now that those, we haven't got them, but uh, usually when it rains, it pours uh, with those cases and we need somebody kind of to uh, uh, be ready to take those cases. Um, so I think, uh, um, so with the short staff that we have right now, I've been able to work with, uh, you know, the Vermont State Police to do coverage on the times that we don't have coverage. Uh, right now, it's, it seems to be working out. Um, and uh, it, it's what we have to do at this point in time. Um, so hopefully, but the bottom line is every, everybody is uh, in law enforcement is suffering right now. I think I said at the last meeting, they're down, Vermont State Police is down 52 positions at this point. Um, you have police departments across the state that are failing right now because of staffing levels. Uh, so Vermont State Police has uh, unfortunately been picking up those departments that are failing as well. So um, it's, it's kind of a domino effect right now, what's going on in law enforcement. Um, and, you know, just to touch on, I mean, it's, it's a hard time to find pe people that want to be in this career. Uh, based on the environment that's going on right now. Uh, in the legislature right now, there's, there's a bill going before the House talking about qualified immunity. Um, my concern is if that bill goes through, you're going to see a mass exit uh, in the law enforcement. I don't know if anybody knows what qualified immunity is, but uh, in basic terms, it's like a good Samaritan law that's out there. Um, you're covered under uh, uh, the qualified immunity as select board members, if you do something in good faith, um, you're covered. Uh, it's still gonna be offered to all government employees within Vermont, but right now in the legislature, they wanna strip that from law enforcement officers. So, you know, you know the rumors out there from people that, that are talking in law enforcement, if that goes through, uh, people are gonna be putting in their resignations at that point. So um, I'm just asking everybody to look into that some point. 
Um, I think that's pretty much it at this point in time. Uh, any questions? I have a question. I'm I'm impressed that you're you've got a pretty steady stream of applicants that we've been interviewing, which is you know necessary step to getting anyone in the door. I'm just curious how you're how we're advertising. How are we attracting people for interviews? Like, how does the word get out? Uh, well, I think the word has been out. I think uh, hope you can uh, talk about this. Uh, there's, it's been advertised that it's out there. And a lot of it has been word of mouth from uh, officers that, uh, um, you know, we're hiring here at Hardwick. And, uh, you know, we, I think we have uh, a couple more applicants at this point in time, but uh, we're fortunate. Most of our applicants have come from um, word of mouth from our other um, employees, other officers. That's good. That's often a good way to attract good people and also have them stay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, we're, also, we're also posting positions as well. Like, are there specific places to post what we? Yeah, we have an ad posted uh, the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council site, and we we're revamping um, we're re revamping the patrol officer and the sergeant ad, and we'll be getting those out. Um, we took one of them down and then we'll be putting the other one up. So we're, we're in the recruiting phase. Good. So if you know of anybody, send them our way. Um, yeah. We do. And, and, and some of the, the best officers um, that come out of the woodwork are in, and, you know, anybody can do this job um, and with the proper training. And sometimes, you know, there's people that are, um, you know, I was one of those people. I, I was, I wondered if I could do the job when I applied and, um, and I just applied and got the training. And I think, you know, if there's people out in, in the community that think they want to help their community in a positive way, you know, they can come to a ride along. Um, they can come talk to the chief or some of the, the officers, but, um, you know, it's, it's an option. It's a good job. Just there's, you, you got to follow, you got to stick to your training and follow the, you know, the protocols. All right. Um, any other questions for Mike? Mike, I just want to say thank you. It's You're welcome. A lot thank to you. Check in. Yeah, we really appreciate you stepping in. It's great. Thanks. All right. I'm going to move us along. Uh, next is item number one, select board to review and consider approving various liquor licenses. So we have in our um, packet, our folder, um, it's, uh, it's quite a list this time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, where is it? Here it is. I only have one question, Tanya, about the outside consumption permit. Can you remind us of yeah. where outside that is? I believe they do, I don't know if they do it once or twice a year. They do, the Legion does out in the back parking lot. They set up a tent and they do like a barbecue, I think. That's what I, I don't have the applications with me there at the okay. office. Hmm? Great. And they're all, all of these. Uh -oh. I didn't hear you. Hmm. Kaylee's frozen. That East Hardwick Internet. So the Legion, it is outside in the back, but I wondered why they need that, considering that we have our, uh, that we don't have a, a ordinance for. So why do they need that? Or because they're serving and they're selling, maybe is that I it? I think so. I think so. And then they need to provide that, like a little enclosed area somehow. Yeah. They they rope it off and put yeah. a little thing on it. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to, because we're online and everything, and I suspect folks who may have joined us don't have this list, I'm just going to read it off. So um, and, uh, so for first class license, um, Hardwick post number seven, American Legion Incorporated is um, needing to be renewed. 
for second class licenses, uh, we have- It might be good to explain what a first class license is. Oh, geez. Um, <laughs> first <laughs> class, I think, is beer, wine, and liquor. Second class, I think, is just wine and beer. I'm not sure about third class. Who's in the third class one? Because that so means retail. It's retail. The only one in the third is Legion. I'm not sure what the difference is. I'll Google it. All right. You do that. I'm going to keep reading. So second class licenses for, okay. GBS LLC, which is doing business as DNL Beverage in Delhi, Global Montello Group Corp. doing business as Jiffy Mart, Tops Market LLC, Hardwick Convenience in Delhi LLC, and Keg of Glory doing business as Birdsong Beer and Wine. So second class is the retail one. <clears throat> yeah. And then first class and third must have to do with serving. Right, right. And then third, okay, so and then a third class license, of, again, the American, the Hardwick Post number seven, American Legion Incorporated, and then an outside consumption permit for the, for the Legion as well. I would like I to move that we grant all these licenses. I can second that. All right, and I just want to put uh, Tanya noted in this list that we have no incidents involving any of the other any of these businesses. All right. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Kaylee, I didn't get you. Yeah. Okay. So that's aye, everybody. So um, motion carries. Um, okay. Item two, select board authorize the town manager to sign a support letter for, VAS, for a VASA grant application to purchase a tracked dump truck that will be used, among other things, on the Wright Farm Road RTP project slated for later in 2022. And um, so Danny Hale is here representing VASA. And uh, Danny, do you just want to say a few words about this? Um, so it's a USDA RBGD, I think is the right letters, uh, grant to purchase a track truck. It'll be used actually in three counties, um, in, in all three counties. Um, so we're seeking support from the towns that we have trails in, um, five of them, just five of them, Hardwick, Lowell, Sutton, Concord, and Brighton. So that's what this is about. I uh, took John Jewett out of retirement and his consulting firm, and he's helping me put together this. Uh, as you all know, I, one of these USDA grants is a lot to a lot of pieces to it. Yes, there are. <laughs> I, like I move that we on. authorize Opie to sign the letter of support. Second that. Kaylee, what were you saying? I couldn't wait. No, Wiz beat me to it. Oh, okay. So discussion. Can I just say that um, in the past we've uh, done these authorizations and I think this is a totally worthy project, but I'd like to confirm that we'll have a copy of the grant narrative on hand in the town manager's office. So we know what it really says because we've had a couple in the past that um, haven't turned out the way we thought they were going to. So I'd just like to be able to track it a little bit better. Uh, not that I question this one, Danny, honestly, but you know, some bad apples cause us all to have to do more work. And I'm paying for it. I get it. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Just a copy so that Casey can have it with her uh, files with the, all the grant information that we've kind of signed off on whether it's for us or to our benefit. Just saying. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the RTP project for the right farm road, just a quick update, I won't take long. It's, Wait, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause you, Danny, because we got a motion on the table. Oh, go ahead. 
All right. So I just want to do the vote. If, if everybody, any more discussion on um, on the letter of support? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 I, I caught, I did not catch Kaylee. Aye. Okay. So that's everybody's aye. Motion carries. All right, Danny, go ahead. RTP. Yeah. Quick update. That's moving forward. I actually met with the wetlands person out there last week. Um, so we're, we'll be ready to go. We're just waiting for RTP, which as you noted, Eric has been postponed, but uh, we're pushing it. But, yep. That's all I have for you folks. Thank you. Great, thanks. thanks I'll, Dan. Stop I'll stop by tomorrow. Hopefully. Okay. Right. Looking forward to voting for you, Danny. Hey, vote for Danny Hale. Vote early. <laughs> vote early and vote often. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is not going to let you vote often. <laughs> no. Uh, no. It's America, you can do that. Oh, okay. Um, all right, hang on. I'm finding my agenda. Here we go. <laughs> right, next is... Item three, business manager Casey Rowell to give quarterly budget update through the end of last year. Hello. Hey, Casey. I'm gonna have Amanda screen. Uh, oh, not this one, Amanda, just the overview one, actually. the um, This is the detailed one, um, just the summary one, please. The FY22, there you go, right there. Okay. Um, so revenues, um, sorry. Can you go up a little bit just so I can see the narrative? Sorry, a little bit harder. Um, so for the most part, we're on track. Um, I don't have water and sewer numbers only because we only have really one quarter. So next time I'll share kind of the halfway point. Um, as is typical this time of year, because we haven't collected all the taxes, the tax revenues, your actual amount you're seeing is of course what we've billed and we have to pay the school. Um, what we budgeted for, that's assuming that we would collect all of those. We um, you know, would expect to be at about 50% at this point in the year. Um, police department revenues are under budget. Obviously we know the Greensboro contract um, and the COPS grant, we have the officer on leave, so we didn't really have much for expense. So um, if we were to figure that we'll collect what we expect in tax revenues, um, we would be at around 35% if we factor in the, the revenue loss there. So we're, we're slightly under where we should be. I know we had some money come in um, in January that of course is not on here, but we had a lot of ticket revenue for police come in over $4,000. So it's, we'll get there, but um, we're, we're a little off right now. So, but- um, Did you say 35%? Yeah, if we were to factor, yeah, if we take that away, basically we'd only be at 35%. If we took away the school? Nope. Um, if we um, if we assume that the tax revenue budget of two and a half million that we're going to get all of that, yep. um, we would be like at 35% right now. And that's because, you know, obviously um, the budget to actual under the PD is 200 and something, 270, two off right now. Questions about the revenue. So sorry, I'm still sorry to be dense, but you're saying that if um, if we assumed that we got all the tax revenue, the 2.5 million and change, mm -hmm. and and basically substituted that in instead of the actual instead of that five million five million two hundred because the five correct. so if basically taking, that... taking out the school amount of that five million essentially. Yes. Okay. So if you do that, then we're only at about 35%. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because you have All to right. take about $3 right. million dollars away from that. So, yeah. And Casey, at this point in the year, where should we be at? 50. About 50%. 
So I would say we're probably like 5% off because if you factor in, um, because we know we're going to be short at the year at the end of the year anyway, probably around roughly as much as 10%. Um, so we're knowing that we should be a little bit short. I'd say we're really only about 5% short right now, kind of where we would expect to be. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's go to expenses. Um, we're pretty on target for expenses. Again, we should be at about 50% as of 12:31, halfway through the fiscal year. Um, we are at 44.88. Um, so we shouldn't get too excited because obviously it's still early in the winter. Um, so we don't know like what's gonna happen with salt and sand and that sort of thing. But I can say that all of our insurances are paid for the rest of the fiscal year. Um, Quite a few of our appropriations have already been paid. Our county taxes have been paid. So we've got a bunch of stuff that's paid through the end of the year, won't have additional expenses. Um, can you just go down a little bit, Amanda, please? Um, so yeah, so overall, um, like I said, the county taxes shows 100%, but that's because we've paid it in full for the year. Um, there's no categories really here. Line items is just a smidge over. Um, and overall 44.88. So we're we're pretty on target for expenses. Casey, can you explain why the rescue squad is zero? Is that because we pay it later? Uh, they just haven't put the request in. They usually okay. just have to send us the formal requests and then I issue it. So yeah, they just haven't requested that yet. Okay, great. Similar to appropriations, we usually just have them send over a formal request so we can use it like as our invoice to pay it. Same with the appropriations. Yeah, same idea. Yes, correct. And I think I paid out a couple more in January, so they'll flow in. And, and if I don't get a request from them by usually April or May, I usually reach out and say, hey, you know, so, but yeah. That, that's usually at 100% by the end of the year. So any questions about the expenses? I think we're obviously trying to be really careful and diligent and as best we can. You know, this is a really helpful report, Casey, thank you. If you don't have any other questions, then all I have for now, and I'll have another update for you in early April for like the nine months, and we'll see where we're at then. Right. That'll give us a little better picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll be through most of the winter. And I'll probably share water and sewer revenues at that time because we'll have at least half the year then. Just the way the billing works by the time I run the report, they've been billed but not collected yet. So probably just have at least the first half of the year for revenues for those. Hmm. All right, sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Casey. All right, you're welcome. And I'll see you back for item eight. All right. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, okay, next we have um, item four is Paul Fix to give us an update on the NEK broadband um, status. Hi, Paul. Hi, Eric. Thank you. So we're going to have a little juggling between Amanda and I because I want to share my screen. So while she does what she needs to do, the first thing is to kind of give you a brief update on what the communication union district's been up to. And then I'd like to share with you some opportunities that are coming up because of ARPA funding. So first of all, Oops, and I've lost my thing. Um, the, uh, the first thing is that in before the end of December, we connected our first customers in Concord, Vermont, which is a big step for an organization that was only founded the March uh, of uh, the beginning of COVID. So during this time, we've, we've now managed to 
pulled some things together, which is good. We've received $1.6 million from the Vermont uh, Community Broadband Board, which was put together by the legislature, uh, acts under the auspices of the Public Service Board, essentially to manage the communication union districts and what parts of any commercial entities are uh, regulatable, is that a word? So, um, so that's good. All of the towns in the Northeast Kingdom, three counties of Orleans, Caledonia, and Essex, have now joined Vermont or the Northeast Kingdom Community Broadband, as has Wolkett. So um, that's a good thing. We don't have any gaps in our coverage. We've also had the state transfer to us more than 100 miles of publicly funded fiber, most of it in northern parts of the Northeast Kingdom. But this is good because it gives us some assets that we can then use to trade with other internet providers in places we need fiber if they need fiber where we are. So some good things are coming along. Um, I don't know if you all saw the webinars Vermont League of Cities and Towns put together with Rob Fish about broadband and ARPA funding. That's something that is worth looking at, particularly in light of what I'm about to share. So um, I think because of the complications of switching back and forth between different applications in this platform, I'm just going to bring this up to give you folks an idea of what we know about Hardwick, and maybe you all know this already. So here's our map of Hardwick and what's happening with broadband. So all of these little spots, and, and I guess I can zoom in so you can see closer what we're dealing with, are residences or businesses in Hardwick that have some kind of internet connectivity. The gray circles are reported by OSSU as locations with students who don't have enough internet connectivity to do their work from home. Now, that could be a family with one child who's got really slow Comcast. It could be a family with five children and two work at home parents who have, um, you know, something, did I say Comcast? I meant consolidated at the low end. It could be somebody with higher speed service that can't meet the needs of the family. So there's no consistent uh, deal with those, but all of them are under 100 megabits a second down and 100 megabits per second up, which is what we're shooting for. Um, <clears throat> to give you some quick idea of what's happening in Hardwick, the parts of town that aren't well served at all now are this part to the west, northwest of Route 14. And this part down here, out beyond Macville Pond, down towards uh, just north of Nichols Pond, and then out along route 15 and sort of south of route 15. So these are the two spots <clears throat> where we will most be concentrating on as we move forward. Um, basically this part in the center is Comcast, Comcast and Consolidated. This is mostly Consolidated coming up through the green here. This is mostly Consolidated with really not great service heading up towards Greensboro. This along here, these orange diamonds, triangles, <clears throat> all now have 100-100 fiber from the Craftsbury uh, operation whose name escapes me at this moment. 
Any Kingdom Fiber, right. Any questions from anyone before I move on to something else? Paul, I have a quick question. Um, how, other than OSSU, how is this data collected? Ah, that's a really good question. It's uh, request, collected from the Public Service Board site. They have been working hard to verify as much as they can with on the ground. Some of it's reported by providers, which we've learned are not always accurate as to what's available where. So there's a there's a wide range of ways it's reported. But uh, for the most part, we know through state records who's where and what speeds. So you can see here, you know, served 100, 100, or these over here at the legend, 100, 100 are these orange lines up Route 14. 25, 3 are these blue ones, which are uh, mostly Comcast. You may get faster service from them, but it's at least 25, 3. 6, 1 are uh, purple ones up in here. So again, it's a hodgepodge, not guaranteed accurate, but likely pretty close. And I'm sorry, I lost my page earlier, but there, if folks want to go to Northeast Kingdom Broadband website, there is a survey. People can report to us what they have and what interest they have in having something faster. And then we'll be building our own database. So th that's great to know. Thank you. So basically, just so I understand, if there is a road on this map that's showing that there's service that is not actually accurate if you're a consumer the thing to do would be to fill out that survey so that way the cud can make accurate descriptions about where in hardwick we should be connecting is that yeah, yeah i mean this map is an internal northeast kingdom broadband map you can guess where the roads are but um you should also i mean if if you're concerned call the public service department and report that you think you're on a map that says you have service and you don't so because they're really the regulatory body that's charged with getting you service so that that should also be done or people can contact me and you know i'll i'll help do what they need to do to get information where it has to be gotten and i have one more question for you paul Sure. Is, is there um, like a is there a, an ideal timing around that? Like, should we be getting the word out to people in Hardwick sooner rather than later that they should be making comments? Or I'm just wondering in terms of timing, like if it's as soon as we get the information, the better. Or there will be a while before we get funding to do this. So I'm just wondering. Uh, so. The 1.6 million we received from Vermont Community Broadband Board is for the design of the network, which includes both the backbone and what we call the spurs. And because that's proprietary, I could share it in executive committee or I could share it with Opie. And as long as Opie shares it with you privately, we could do that. But at this point, it, we have competitors whose names I've mentioned and who you know that we really can't share this with. So um, the bottom line is get the word out sooner or, you know, sooner rather than later. I am struggling with the board and the executive committee of my organization to, to get them to make more of this public, but we could do that through Front Porch Forum, et cetera. They're concerned because we don't yet have a public relations or marketing person about getting overwhelmed with requests for information. So there's kind of a, you know, a catch 22 there, but the people who are interested in better service should be reaching out uh, through our website and potentially or should through the public service department. So good questions. I'm just wondering if that's something that either you or the town can post on Front Porch Forum. I think that would be valuable, just putting those two links out there to the community and maybe our our website. 
I can do that. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Good. All right. So secondly, is where all this money that the governor talked about during his state of the state and budget addresses is going and how we can make use of it. So let's share this screen and see if I can make the slideshow work. So that Vermont Community Broadband Board has a construction grant program. The goal of the program is to speed up the rollout of 100-100 broadband. That's through Act 71 passed by the legislature June 8th. So the board is offering to match town contributions of state fiscal recovery funds, which most of us are calling ARPA funds. There's a pool of $16 million that's going first come first serve. Northeast Kingdom Broadband, who's getting funding through other sources from ARPA, is willing to match any funds the town is interested in putting up, which means that for each dollar of ARPA contributions the town wants to make, it will result in $3 invested in broadband in the town and speed up construction by several years. I know that's sort of vague and that's basically what we can say at this point. So what I'm, uh, I guess my comments to you come in two ways today. You folks have appointed me to this organization. This is the info coming to me from the organization and I'm passing it on to you. What I'm hoping you folks could give me today is some sense of whether this is something you'd like me to try to learn more about or whether as an unpaid volunteer, both for the town and Northeast Kingdom Broadband, it's pointless for me to think much about this. So here's the details. This money could go and essentially we can use this money to reach those underfunded priority, those gray circle priority addresses if the town provides money. If we, if the town doesn't provide ARPA funds, we have to do them on a slower schedule, which is how the money could speed things up. So the money isn't going to make anything happen that wouldn't happen anyway, but it will speed it up. So we calculated, and this is very rough at this point, 11 miles of spurs, which cost us about $40,000 a mile to build, or basically to hang fiber. And that's after Hardwick Electric does what's called make ready work to make the poles ready to put fiber on. So as part of this, we're all going to want to encourage Hardwick Electric to do the make ready work, which they'll get paid for. That's part of the $40,000 a mile, but um, that could affect the timing. If Hardwick were to make, so that's $440,000 to build those spurs. If Hardwick were to contribute 147, the state and Northeast Kingdom broadband would contribute the rest. We could also use that money to subsidize subscriber connections, which again, Northeast Kingdom Broadband would over time do, and we'd recoup it over years of service from the customer. But there are 450 addresses in those two main blocks I was showing to you. That's north and west of Route 14 and to the southeast of town. With 40% of those people actually switch to us, then that would be 180 connections at roughly a thousand dollars a subscriber. And that would cover the cost of running a fiber from the pole to their house, the hardware at their house and what infrastructure is needed to connect them to the main fiber spur and backbone. So that's about 180,000. 
If Hardwick wanted to make a third of that contribution, that would be about 60,000. So ultimately we'd be looking at 200 or 207,000 to, to make this happen. And um, so I can switch this back and we can chat about, so that's, you know, one thing that occurs to me, and I don't know if this has changed. I know back when John was here and ARPA funds got talked about, the town was thinking of using some funds for sludge removal from pits at the, or from ponds at the sewer plant, which obviously mainly benefits people in town who are on the sewer district that would otherwise need to bond. Here's an option that would benefit people who aren't on town water and sewer. So just as a throw out, um, you know, there might be interesting ways to use ARPA funds that would benefit a wider group of Hardwickians. So again, I throw that out. Um, a, a lot of towns seem to be interested in, I don't, in this. I don't know that any have actually taken us up on it. I can send Opie the grant documents and all the backup detail and you know I guess at this point if you guys say no we know what we're doing with ARPA funds then I don't have to think about it any, anymore if you folks say it's interesting then we'll go into more detail to actually make maps that show who'd get covered to count the exact numbers to do estimates a little more closely etc so that's what's happening in the Northeast Kingdom community broadband at this point. Paul, at this time, is there a deadline for making that decision? Uh, the deadline for making that decision is before you folks decide to spend all your ARPA money. <laughs> I think the of the 16 million, if the 16 million isn't spent by September, what isn't spent is going back into a pool to be given to people who got first round funding rather than waiting for people who haven't. So realistically, well before September, but September, I think at the latest, would be where, where we are. And at this point, there's no harm in us saying we're interested in finding out more because we're not really committing, we're just interested. Uh, the only harm is that uh, I discovered you're not really interested and I did a lot of legwork for nothing. And then, but no, there's no harm at all. We're not, let me rephrase that. We're not signing up. We're not signing up for the program. No, 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 no. Definitely not. I mean, I think it's, I think it's interesting and worth pursuing. The state through the community broadband board has obviously said, this is a legitimate use for town broadband, their town ARPA funds to meet the needs of these people who've been promised service year after year after year and still don't have it. I mean, I think that's where we're going. David. But Paul, I'm confused. This is Liz. Um, we have been told a couple times that yes, you can spend this ARPA money on broadband, but you shouldn't because there's other money to be spent specifically on broadband. Am I mixing up two pots of money and this is the second one that's designed to be spent on broadband? Or is this the first that they were saying you could, but wait, there'll be more? I think there's a lot of information coming from a lot of places as the ARPA money came down. I don't know where you heard what. I, I do know that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns webinar certainly gave people reason to think, gave towns reason to think about using ARPA funding for broadband. And I think the legislature in that Act 71 clearly wanted to incent towns to do so. So uh, I, I don't know where information not to do it was coming from, but I, I, that's what I can share. It looks like the this, this state is incenting by providing a one-to-one -one match, incenting people to towns to do some funding. And again, I, I certainly, you know, as a, as a Hardwick resident, I say to myself, this is going to happen anyway. It's just going to take a couple years longer. And as a Hardwick resident, I say, 
you know, we're paying a thousand dollars to connect someone's house that Vermont Community Broadband otherwise would have to t take out of revenues. So what does this do for the town? Well, what it means is it brings us to a point sooner where we've got a self-supporting organization that can then go to the bond bank to reach those places that aren't even on this list. And those places are further up Route 16 in Hardwick and uh, <laughs> over that way. So it, I think it will bring broadband to Hardwick sooner, but it probably won't do anything that wouldn't happen anyway. It'll just accelerate it by two years, maybe a little more. So and I don't know. Economic development uh, ramifications. I would expect so. I mean, certainly for, you know, you want young people who are doing high-end computer CAD work and design work from home, they're not going to move into rural Hardwick at this point. So we, the other thing I will say is I do know at our board meeting coming up next week, they expect to put a proposal in front of us of what the cost of this service is. And it looks like uh, the basic service, which could be 50 up, 50 down, could be had for um, somewhere between 50 and $100 a month is about all I can say at this point. Um, there will be services for 100, 100 and services for gigabit, which will be available from this organization. Um, and I think they'll be competitively priced, but that's not going to be 20 or $30 a month unless we find, at this point, there's $40 subsidies from the federal government. So that would help during COVID, but it's going to be, it's, it's not going to be cheap. It's going to be competitively priced. Opie, you were going to say something several times. Um, it's it's been pointed out to me uh, with the final rule that came out with the ARPA funds that we need to demonstrate um, the public information gathering process um, with how we spend our ARPA funds. And if they um, they'll do an audit, and I think you know after this is all complete, like. 2027 time frame, and if towns if it if it shows that we didn't do our due diligence and and have the public have public input of how to spend these funds, um, they could take the money back. So uh, this is very helpful, and I think that it's definitely something that the community needs to think about. Um, and I you know we we need more. We need more people coming forward and and giving us yeah hey this is giving us the thumbs up or no we 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 want to put it over here so um, again I appreciate your time and the work that you're doing. Yep, I think VLCT has uh, some processes they're developing for how towns can meet those and request yep. input. I think on this particular project the fact that the state is incenting matches will go well towards demonstrating that the community of Vermont sees this as a benefit. So I, I just threw that out there. Yeah. But uh, either now or at some future time, you guys can get back to me and tell me whether it's worth gathering more information for your fact finding. So it sounds like what you're saying, David, is that before we say, Paul, go find out more information, we should have more of a public meeting that maybe includes the two slides that Paul just had, include some of the information that we have about the water and sewer project, and then also says, here are some other projects that we know of. Are there any, is there any public comment or any other projects that the community wants to talk about? Right, yes. But I, I think um, it would be great to have a little more detail, Paul, because um, just, you know, at first glance, looking through that, um, like 11 miles, I don't know, in my mind, doesn't cover those two sections of town you talked about. So I may be wrong because I'm just thinking, you know, I'm not charting it out on a map, but it'd be great to see a little more information about that. And also it sounds like in the next coming weeks, you'll have better data on what the rates 
consumer rates will be for the service. Um, so I think it'd be great to have a little more information on it. So I think it's a good thing for you to work on. All right. And I think the 11 miles covers getting to the gray circle priority addresses in those sections. Cause that's, uh, that's what drives the project and our ability to, to do it. So yeah, I'm happy to go gather more and I think I can go back to the, um, NEK broadband and say the town's interested enough to be worth, uh, developing the proposal more and uh, we can figure out where to, where to go from there. And I'll get David all the backup information and I will post a front porch forum item with who to contact to update your personal address and express interest in going further. Thanks so for I, your time. Uh, I have just one more question for you before you leave. And that is, um, you mentioned a couple times that the, um, you know, that the connection, the thousand dollar per house or whatever connection for, you know, that would be paid back through, um, through the, sure. the rates. Um, yep. So if the town used ARPA funding, ARPA money to help subsidize that, does that mean the rates would be lower or does that mean that any, the NEK broadband would still collect the same amount? We're hoping to establish the same rate for every address and business served in the three counties. What it means is, and that we were talking about this the other day, more ARPA does mean we could do lower rates. Our plan is to start with higher rates and lower them as business conditions permit, rather than starting with low rates and raising them if it turns out we've underestimated them. So um, again, privately, I could share an executive session what that might look like, and I can talk to David about that if he'll agree to share with you privately. Where, but so, bas so, basically, so could I, could I uh, summarize that back to you as um, if we committed ARPA funds, we're not necessarily lowering rates for Hardwick people. We're just over some long time frame potentially lowering rates for um, the whole Northeast Kingdom. If enough towns wanted to give us ARPA funds, and that's probably two thirds of the town, rates would come down 10 to $12 a customer pretty immediately. But until we know how much ARPA funds we have, it's impossible to say. Unfortunately, it's the cart before the horse. and. What we, what we want to be able to do ultimately is get those places where there are only one or two houses per mile, which if it's $40,000 for us to build a mile of fiber, getting those places where there are one or two houses in a mile means it's going to cost us 41000 or, you know, 21000 to get those two houses. So that's we know, we, this is why we don't have good internet currently. And that's why we're coming to the town saying, help your remotest addresses get service. We're not trying to go to people who are off grid. They're going to have to fend for themselves, unfortunately. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Great. Uh, so next is item five, select board to authorize the town manager and assistant town clerk for the 2021 one series fire truck bond so we can get reimbursed for the truck through US Bank. And this is, I believe, because the previous paperwork had a previous town manager and only Alberta's name. And we need Tanya to be on there too. Is that correct? Someone? Anyone? Uh, can I just say so moved? <laughs> I can second that. <laughs> All right. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. That's everyone. Somebody has questions? So they, so. Somebody's, hello? Oh. Sorry, that was me. I apologize. All right. Uh, next, uh, item six, select board to authorize the town manager to sign permission for the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District Household Hazardous Waste Event on August 27th, 2022. 
this will be a, this will be a town garage. Yes. As usual. Awesome. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor? Please say aye. 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 All right. That's everybody. Motion carries. Tell them to float the ark up here too. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, but they're yeah they're still looking for property. So if anybody knows a property that is for sale for their household hazardous waste facility that they're that they have most of the money to build, but they don't have land yet. Um, I thought we already talked to them and they didn't want to come to Hardwick. Yeah, Hardwick is is still uh, considered too far uh, out of the central. They want something in Barry Berlin. Hmm. They are a central Vermont solid waste district that we are a member of. And so we are on, we are sort of a spur, which is why we get oh, yeah. this event. Um, but this event, the cost of this event has almost doubled. So oh. it's uh, for them. So, so take advantage. It's gonna be interesting. Yeah, we should take full advantage of it because I don't know how long it's gonna be before we have some place to take it. All right. So I'm sorry, I got a lot. So motion carried on that one. We're all good with item six, right? Yes. All right. Item seven, select board to authorize town manager to accept the terms and conditions of the Yellow Barn Vermont Community Development Program grant agreement when finalized and authority to execute all appropriate documents. So this is a grant that we got for the Yellow Barn. Oh. So moved. Go. Huh? So moved. So moved. Second. <laughs> okay. You can go um, ahead and explain what it is now if you want. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to say that it's um, it's a grant that we got. It's almost a million dollars. Um, they The state agency that administers this was a little backlogged, even though we got this grant quite a while ago. We didn't, they just barely are getting the grant agreement together. So that's why we're doing it now. Um, okay. Any Any questions? This, this requires all your signatures. It requires, yeah, so we're going to have to stop in and sign it because we're we're going to have to sign, we have to do this vote, but then we'll have to sign that we're um, having uh, OP um, manager for us. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Michael? Aye. Okay, I think that, so that's everybody. Motion carries. Uh, next, um, due to item eight, we changed to KC, but I can't remember what. Connie's kitchen. Update on the economic development loan. That's the one. Yeah, um, so I'm sure a lot of you have heard um, that, um, Terry Coolbeth with Connie's Kitchen um, plans to sell the business um, to Stephen Carroll Parks. Um, she um, was was going to close, and luckily they stepped up and they want to um, step in and keep the business open. So that's great news. Um, so what that means is we do have an economic development loan with Connie's Kitchen. And I have spoken to both Terry, I've spoken to the parks. The parks are gonna fill out a loan application and hopefully we'll have that for the next meeting um, to basically take over that loan. And of course it would be in their name, there'd be new borrowers. So that's, that's the plan. We'll have hopefully an application package for the next meeting. Sounds good. Okay, so that was yeah. all, for, all we've got for now. And that's the really the best way to do it is for them to you know put it into their own name. So um, yeah, so that's Great. it. Great. Just giving you a heads up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. So now we're to select board reports, new business or old business. What do you got? I've got some old business. Um, we talked about um, ATV or side-by-side -side access for VASA to the center of town a couple of weeks ago. Um, I just want to get, uh, put, throw that back in to the ring and try to get uh, something nailed down or a plan to nail something down. Can we add that to our next agenda? Yes. Great. 
I've got a select board report. Go ahead. Um, the uh, the RFQ for the consultant to work with the downtown commission um, on our uh, downtown designation and and forming the nonprofit and all of that. So that's been posted and it has a deadline um, as Monday the the seventh that people will hopefully submit some uh, their inf their credentials I suppose and then we'll the uh, group of committee of the downtown commission will meet to review those candidates to consider on Tuesday. Um, I heard today that the first set of 15 welcome to Hardwick new banners are ready. They're in Rutland. If anybody's going to Rutland, please let me know. Um, not going to rush down there tomorrow or anything, but um, if anybody has to go anyway, let me know. Otherwise, I'll make some kind of plan to go down and pick them up next week sometime. I, I think that I, I know of um, someone that travels down there uh, on a regular basis. I can talk to them. Oh, yeah. So we'll talk about that. Um, and I then I have a, just a little old business or something. Um, I had requested that we talk about the grants, like the spreadsheet that we discussed way back, oh, you know, last spring or something, because there were so many grants out there. And um, I wondered what was happening with that sort of project. And Casey got back to me with a really uh, lovely, very comprehensive report. But I'd like to, at some future meeting, actually go over that a little bit in public at a meeting so that people have a better concept of all of the things that are being juggled um, in order to better the town in so many ways. Yeah. Um, and then on the grant thing, I, um, I signed up for the Better Places webinar on Thursday next. Uh, I think Opie's also gonna be on that, but that's the, the new, newer version of a, from the state um, Better Places grant that Richard Amore with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development is in charge of. Um, and then the uh, uh, AARP uh, grant is coming up again. I just got the info for that. So I'll be looking for a, a report at some point from our community development coordinator Maybe he could attend a meeting. So I talked to Jeff um, about this and we're getting things together for him to be on the, ne the next agenda to present. Um, and then in terms of the AARP, um, he mentioned that um, it's a very competitive grant. It's nationwide. And we had um, the Grange in East Hardwick um, applied for it and didn't get it last year. And his concern, uh, what I need to do is reach out to Rose and see if she's going to apply for it again. What we want to avoid doing is having two entities in Hardwick applying for the same grant. And uh, that's, why I, that's why I think this report is so important so that yeah. we can see what everybody's doing yeah. uh, and then have that information gathered because okay. then we can weigh which one is potentially more successful. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. There were something like 13, nine or 13 grants of AARP grants given in Vermont last year. Yeah. Um, just not one of ours. And I'm not absolutely certain that the Grange actually ever fully applied. Okay. I thought about it. So that sheet that Casey has are just grants that we've applied for or that we've received. So I, I would probably try, I think what you're asking is we should try to put out to everybody, all the organizations in town that are applying for grants funding, um, if we can all share that information. Well, at least have the information on there about the grants that we do know about because the select board has decided to support them like the BASA one that Danny had tonight. Yeah. I okay. mean, so that we have, have some, play, some um, place where we can go to see whether or not we're, you know, it's confusing to keep track of this stuff and yeah, yeah, just to yeah. try to. 
I get it. Yeah. So the spreadsheet that I have um, is just the town's grant. So you mentioned really? something like VASA. It's just um, active ones. So ones that we've been awarded are in, you know, currently active. Maybe we haven't used the funds yet. And then it has um, applied ones. I think I even had some denied ones. And then ones that are um, were finished during the fiscal year. Right. So they were used. So it has all of that. And obviously it's strictly yeah, for the no, town. It's great. Um, and I'm glad that we have that. But <laughs> What I'm proposing here is that our community development coordinator person actually be the coordinator of that report as it's expanded into it so we know what's you know what's out there and what our opportunities are. As we get further into planning and having projects that are ready to go, when we see funding opportunities, that would be a really helpful piece of information that, you know, Jeff knows a lot of these things. I mean, that person knows what's out there and they know what other people are doing too. Right. And the, I just want to say uh, the thing with Jeff is that um, he, he reached out to John um, about his role with Hardwick and where he, um, what he was capable of doing in terms of having his time. And really Jeff is turned into a consultant and somebody that is willing to write grants for us at a very discounted rate. And that he feels that um, if, if, he want, if you want from him as a community, the, if, the, if the town wants a community development coordinator, Jeff is not gonna be doing that. And he's okay with us finding somebody else to do the community development coordinator job. Um, so we have, we can't put more work on him that, that he's already told us that he's, he's not willing to do that. We've agreed to do, to, to not put on him. So um, I'm always looking for somebody within the community that can write grants that wants to step into the community development role. But Jeff has made it clear that he is, this he's not doing this yeah no i've understood that from him yeah so we we can't call jeff on the carpet to to be doing something that he's already told us that he doesn't he he cannot he's not going to do so we you, you so asking jeff to do any more than we're already asking him is is not going to happen okay uh, casey could you um if you didn't send that report to the whole board, could you please? Yes. Thank yep. you. And then, and then it sounds like what we need to do is we need to, when, any, when anybody comes to a select board meeting or when anybody um, requests uh, a letter of support, um, and, and I, I agree with you, Sherry, I think this is very important that we have a copy of the grant on file and really before we even write the letter of support. Um, yeah. I, you know, I heard some other things about the, 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 the grant request, the letter of support request for the Woodbury Mountain Preserve um, that I wasn't happy about hearing. Um, it wasn't really presented to us by that, that organization as it was going down that way. So I am 100% on board with call, get, asking for a little bit more information than, um, than somebody sitting in front of the board and saying, well, will you support this grant? Because they're gonna, they're gonna tell us what we wanna hear. I absolutely agree. I, would, I also wanna add that I think that grants are also revenue and that when we have our revenue and expenditure report, we should include any new grants that we've received. They just end up showing up in a different way in our budget. And so I think that would be an opportunity for us to to kind of keep track of that spreadsheet that Sherry's talking about. So if we could see that during those budget reports, then we could kind of keep track of the grants that the board would at least know what's coming in um, in terms of that revenue, if that's possible. Yeah, like the tricky thing with that is um, until we've actually received reimbursement or if it's a grant where you get the money up front, which is rare, it doesn't really get booked in our system. It shows, you know, we've been awarded the money but it's really just sitting there until we 
you know, spend it and then get reimbursed for that's it. Okay. So, that's okay, yeah. Casey, because it's essentially the same with our tax revenue. Like, you know, we that's been voted in. It's not like what we just saw was that we haven't received all that money yet. It's the same with a grant, but I think I think that's an opportunity when we're just looking at revenues and expenses to see, oh, look, we got two grants for, you know, we got the VORAC grant and this USDA grant. I, I think that would be an opportunity to just keep the board and the public informed as to new grants that are coming in. I mean, I- So maybe yeah. with the quarterly budget report, we just report each quarter of any new grant awards or something like that. But, but grant revenue is in the revenue line in the budget, so, right? I mean- Yeah, it is like so for stuff that we've already received, like we yeah. have um, uh, that $3,500 one. I remember if that was AARP or the placemaking I know the banner one, Sherry, you know which one I'm talking about. Speaking, yeah, like so that money was received. So that is in there as grant revenue. Um, but again, most of our grants are reimbursables. So, um, you know, obviously Yellow Barn has millions of dollars of grants, but they're not, you know, we're not seeing that revenue just yet. I think once you guys see that report, I'm sorry, I didn't realize, I thought it was in the Google Docs. And so I thought everybody was seeing it, but once you see that, I think it it's very comprehensive and it may just be that we want to quarterly take a look at where that's at and just review that as its own like thing. But I don't know. Yeah, but that's all that's all I'm talking about, Sherry. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. I um, think having some way to, and I don't know what the way is, but having some way to share with people of the town that they're spending $3 million of taxpayers' money, but the town staff is pulling in something like <clears throat> nine to $12 million in grant funds to actually help, so help support the town is just stunning. That, that if this town takes, takes $12 million to run, the taxpayers are paying a third, a fourth of that. And that I think is a perspective that, that is frequently lost. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I do have a select board report and old business. Good. Um, just was well, kind of old business, but we talked, we already talked about it a little bit at the meeting. I'm just wondering if we can, um, seems like we need to have that community meeting about ARPA funds sooner rather than later, just based on, um, the minutes I read from the last meeting around the, the septic update. Um, I think it'd be, I know we have time to spend that money, but it seems like we have some projects that really need that money. So I'm wondering how we want to do that and when we want to get that date in the books, if we want it to be a special meeting or a part of a select board meeting, I think it would behoove us to schedule it so we can have that conversation and at least figure out how we, like who we want to. Okay. Casey has an idea. Casey pitched an idea uh, before our next select board meeting, I believe. Casey, you there? Uh, that was for the pre town meeting, informational meeting, not specifically the ARPA. I was okay. thinking we could do that, the informational meeting before town meeting, like at 5 30 on the 17th before the regular select board meeting. So uh, I'm not sure about ARPA. Good. I was wondering, that was my question before we started this meeting was when are we going to do that's a perfect it would work out well because it's, I think it's about 12 days before town meeting so in terms of timing, um, people may have their town reports by then. Um, so it's I think having it before the 17th regular meeting would work out well if we could the, do it at 5 30 that night the pre town meeting meet right? yes the yeah. pre town meeting the information where we kind of recap the budget and that sort of thing so what if our the arpa public um whatever we whatever it's called that uh first round of uh having a public discussion about the arpa funds what if that happens just after town meeting once yeah, I, th I think that seems like a good idea that it would be probably the second meeting in March because the first one is really the organizational meeting. So that second meeting in March, somewhere around that time. So we could do it again, maybe 530 before the second meeting in March. And that's good. Also the 17th, right, Casey? Yes, correct. 
Let's and do Kaylee, it. you had one other thing. Yeah, so this is in the board folder, but um, the this is a select board business, but the equity committee, um, there were two members who put together a, uh, one of the tasks we created for ourselves was going through the town website to look at um, what initially we were looking at was places in the town website where um, we could support more inclusion um, and maybe have more inclusive language. That also turned into um, checking the links on the website and what's working and not working. And I know that Maya has done a bunch of work on this already. Um, so this is in the it's uh, in the board folder. Um, the there are lots of small things like links that don't work, which I think would fall on really on Maya, right, David, to to help us with, or like that would be a town um, a town offices. Um, thing to check, but it also is helpful. There are a couple of things on the town clerk pages. Again, this was done a couple months ago, so maybe these have been fixed. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the big things that we wanted to present to the town were um, on our history page. There's not a, any language around the Abenaki past or present, which we felt like um, is a big part of our history. Um, we also noted that um, there's a little bit of context about uh, the people who came here to cut stone and French Canadian migration. We felt like there is a pretty rich history there that maybe we could elaborate on on the town website. Um, we did notice maybe this has changed whiz, but that the historic depot link goes straight to the Vermont Historic Society instead of your website um, that might have changed again. Um, there are a lot of things that are just kind of outdated. Um, but then we also, um, on the depot website, noticed that there wasn't mention of the Abenaki. Um, and what else was there? Um, one of our members who's no, no longer on the committee, but um, she moved to Hardwick a couple of years ago, uh, felt like when she moved to town, um, she looked at the website and felt like it would have been helpful if there was some sort, sort of welcoming page, like, welcome to those of you who are new to Hardwick here whether it's a state, it could be a simple statement, it could be a, a link. Um, I know that there are towns, the town of Craftsbury has worked on this. Um, there's even a group, the Northeast, King, uh, Northeast Kingdom group, that's like a welcoming committee group that has a lot of language around, you know, how to um, how to welcome new people to town kind of. Um, so that was something that she felt like would be helpful in terms of inclusion. Um, but the big, I think the big takeaways were, expanding um, our language around history to go to include Abenaki history. Um, I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of resources out there for that. And there are a lot of people in our community and in the Northeast Kingdom who could help support language around that. Um, there's not a timeline for this, but I think it's something, um, you know, a big part of what the equity committee is working on is making Hardwick more inclusive and um, safer and represent representative of the people who live here. Um, so these are just some things that we would like to either help the town work on or encourage the town to work on. Um, and again, you can look, look at that um, and yeah, if anybody has any questions. Kaylee, I read through that report and I looked at the town history page and, and was somewhat took aback. I have no idea who wrote that, who supports that, who's responsible for that. It wasn't the historical society. I also have no idea. What um, <laughs> I went back to our history of part of the page on the historical society, not without its problems. Um, based, I mean, it's got lots of problems to it, but I did update the first paragraph is now about what we know about Abnaki's in this area. Um, well, that's not quite entirely true either. But what I wanted to suggest tonight was that rather than the town try to maintain a town history page, why doesn't the town website just link to the historical societies? town history webpage yeah, wow. and then it becomes you know there's there's the responsible party for maintaining access to town the town history is responsible for putting the town history out to the public instead of having a couple of different places trying to do the same thing I perfect more ways that sounds perfect 
And then the welcoming page, do we want to just put welcome to Hardwick taxes you're due in May? <laughs> May 10th. Works for me. May 10th. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just had to throw that out there. It was a little humor. Yeah. Haley, shall I get in touch with Maya? That's a good, that's a better question for OP, I think. Um, yeah, Maya's reachable. Uh, if you can, I've talked to her about this uh, this week. Um, she knows that there will be some changes coming. Um, she's very receptive to whenever we reach out to her. And um, if I'm sure you can, I can fuse the gap if you want. I can get in touch with her and tell her that you'll be getting in touch with her or you can just reach out to her. You're on mute, Liz. I'll just contact her. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, and the only other thing that we, um, and this has come up before at select board meetings as well is, and I know that you've been working on this OP is that, that the town having a Facebook and an Instagram and an, all that good stuff. So that was just another, it's not, so just, an, <laughs> no, no, I no. <laughs> no. So that was just in terms of, um, that was just brought up as something that we could, <laughs> we can vote on it. <laughs> the downtown commission is trying to have some sort of a presence on Facebook and I, you know, I don't know. I, the jury's out in my mind on how useful that really is because. Okay. In my personal opinion, I, I think that Facebook pages are good for like the rec committee and to keep people informed as to what's going on. But I think Facebook is um, in my own personal opinion is uh a problem with our society right now yeah i think people if we can find a way to create a informational page for new people on the town website i think that's a better idea me too i absolutely agree I'm happy to try to help with that we may be a bunch of luddites but yeah um, Great. Well, what do you think kelly sure Sure. Oh, yeah. come on. You got to give us more than just sure. I mean, the truth I, will, is I will just say that one of the most popular Instagram accounts is the Streets of New Orleans, um, which is hilarious. It's like all kinds of people posting great shots of never heard of it. Roads. Oh, man. Just saying that I'm on Instagram, regretting I mean, endlessly entertaining. That, downtown but, Harvick is, not, is not, not like the Streets of New Orleans. <laughs> that is Nor not. Nor do we uh, want it to be. No. <laughs> I think that is not that is not the main focus of what I wanted to bring to all of you. It was mainly the history, and I think that's a great solution, Wiz, and then also um, some of the links and reports and things that weren't working. So I think... Um, but I think the welcome page idea I, is really great, and it's helpful. And I can go to my uh, emails that I sent out to my new neighbors in the last year um, and probably glean quite a bit of information that I could share as a just a general Hardwick info um, you know about recycling and all that stuff where things are who to talk to work on it uh, Tanya did you have something yeah I was just gonna say that the land record link that's been fixed and then that the 21 town reports not up yet because not out yet right Great. Um, I have one thing, old business. Um, do we have any progress on the um, swinging bridge and the USDA? The last email that I received was from Susie Poland saying that she was going to forward all the emails I've been sending to Becca Schrader to her program director. And it was at the last meeting that we talked about the Freeman Foundation. 75,000, was it not? Yes, that's, that's, that's a great thing towards the bridge, but yep. se separate, but great. It's you great. Know, I have to go. Um, I've got a house full of company and I said I'd be available at, at 7.45. So, uh, so you, we, we should adjourn then. I think we're done. <laughs> Is everybody done? Right. Wiz Most has to go, here. we need to adjourn. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank all. you. Good night. Good night. Next time. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs>